The conservatorship that controlled Britney Spears' every move for 13 years is no more, thanks to an L.A. judge's long-awaited ruling. The case gained international attention through the hashtag Free Britney movement and centered around a legal arrangement first created in 2008, which put her father in control of both Spears' finances and her personal life, from her ability to travel to where and when she could seek medical and mental health care. But as her lawyer said after the decision was made, this was not a victory for Spears alone. She helped shine a light on not only this conservatorship, but she helped shine a light on conservatorships and guardianships from coast to coast. Activists for senior citizens and people with disabilities have pointed to the million-plus people living under conservatorships in the U.S. at any given point, many of whom, like Spears, have lost basically all of their personal freedoms, with questions about whether such drastic steps are necessary in all such cases. I'm joined by attorney Jonathan Martinez. He's the senior director for law and policy at Syracuse University's Burton Blood Institute. It advocates for people with disabilities, and he was the lawyer in the successful Justice for Jenny litigation. He's also spoken at Free Britney rallies over the years. Jonathan Martinez, good to see you. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. What's the likely impact of the Spears case, let's say, for the that portion of the million-plus conservatorships that have gone too far? To be determined, but I can tell you what I hope. I hope that, like Mr. Rosengard said, Brittany's case does, in fact, shine a light and inspire others. He's correct. There are, by some estimates, between 1.2 and 1.5 million people in guardianship right now. By one study, over 90% have lost all of their rights. And if Britney Spears can be a beacon for them to say, like she did, I want my rights back, it will have a great impact. We should be clear here, you're not against all conservatorships or guardianships, which I think are essentially uh, the same thing. Your view, I believe, is that in situations like Spears, she may have needed help with some issues, but she didn't need her life totally taken away from her. Is that a fair summary of where you are on these issues? Absolutely. I never say there should never be guardianships. My sister is the guardian of my godson, and mm. thank God for it, because she empowers him to live the best life. The concern I have, like you said, is with people who can manage or direct their own lives, having their right to do so being taken away. It's why I say before putting someone in a guardianship, the most important question we can ask, what else have you tried? Because if something could empower them and let them maintain their rights, that would be a far better option. What supported decision-making? What does that mean? Well, you just did it. You absolutely just did supported decision-making because you didn't know something and you asked someone who you thought does for advice and information. And that is what supported decision-making is. It is something that each and every one of us does each and every day. And in fact, think about the cliches we have about decision-making. Don't go off half-cocked, make an informed choice, don't make a snap judgment, get a second opinion. All of these mean get support to make the decisions you make. And people without disabilities or temporarily able-bodied people, as I call them, are <laughs> praised for doing that. So, People with disabilities, not so much. I, here's what I don't understand. You've told us, you've been on the radio with us, you've told us 14 states, most recently New Hampshire, I believe, plus D.C., have laws about supported decision-making. And by the way, there have been bills filed in Massachusetts in the last few years, and they're pending, but as of the moment, they're not going anywhere. What I don't understand about the need for those bills is my understanding is virtually every state statute around conservatorships or guardianships says the judge, if he or she decides they're appropriate, should take the least restricted route to protection of that individual. Well, if the least protected route is supported decision-making, why don't they just do that? Why do they need a separate statute? You're right, in theory. And in practice, it just doesn't happen. We know, again, we know that 90% of guardianships are plenary and take away all rights. And even in states, and I've been published on this, I think it's something like 48 of the 50 states plus DC have specific laws saying exactly what you said. Guardianship cannot be entered unless a person is unable or incapable or put in the least restrictive option. All of these encompass supported decision-making. The problem, 
What we know, again, from data collection and from studies, it's just not happening. So adding specific recognition for supported decision-making as a less restrictive alternative might just mean a judge looks it up, might just mean an attorney gives it a try, and might just mean that some people could keep their rights. You know, the two things about the Spears case that have put me over the edge, one, that she was unable to pick her own lawyer. I want to get to that in a second with you. And two, that she didn't even know until late in the game that she could petition a court to end this thing. Speaking of the lawyer thing, correct me if I'm wrong, a person in a guardianship doesn't have the right to choose his or her lawyer. Is that, is that correct? Some judges have said that, and here's the reason why, and I'm not saying you I agree with this. In fact, to me, this is awful. But the argument that comes from some is that for a person in a guardianship, that person must be declared to be legally incompetent and unable to contract. Retaining a lawyer is a contract. And here's the problem with that point of view. Just like you said, it dooms people to never having someone to advocate for them. Consider Britney Spears. The analogy I always give is this. Everyone celebrated when Britney Spears got to choose her own lawyer yeah. after 13 years in a guardianship. But what that meant is this. If 13 years ago, Britney Spears had committed murder with an ax, if she was an ax murderer, she could have picked her own lawyer then. So what happens to people across the country is people with disabilities, especially those in guardianship, have less rights than ax murderers. And it forces us to ask two questions. Why? Why are we treating people with disabilities as having less rights than ax murderers? And two, can't we do better? And shouldn't we do better? You know, uh, the other thing, as I mentioned to you, Jonathan, a second ago, is this whole notion that Spears apparently didn't even know that she had a right to petition a court to end this uh, this. Uh, prison-like conservatorship, apparently, of her father. Uh, don't states require that there be some periodic review, or is it just you lie in a de facto cell until you make a move? I mean, what, are this, what do the laws say? Some do. The vast, the vast majority do not. And you, again, bring up one of the biggest problems. And in the Britney Spears case, it's, it's highlighted even more. I mean, she had a court-appointed attorney, someone who was paid from her estate. So as long as she was in guardianship, a court-appointed attorney was being paid by her, even though she didn't want to be in that conservatorship. So there was somebody who at least we have to think had a vested interest in keeping her in, because that person, according to Brittany, never told her she could ask to get out. That means that lawyer made 13 years of payments from her estate. And if he never told her that one of her rights is to ask to terminate the conservatorship, then I don't know what to tell you. It's terrifying, isn't it? Imagine not only not knowing that you can fight, but not knowing that you have someone to fight for you or even have a right to have someone to fight for you. Is it too radical to suggest that one of the things legislatures should contemplate since the current system is not working is rather than periodic review, which is honored in the breach, that these things be sunset? So the rebuttable presumption is that after a period of time that the judge determines up front that can be no longer than X, that person's uh, 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 being under a guardianship terminates unless the state or whoever is the appropriate uh, player demonstrates again that he or she needs to be in a guardianship. Is that absurdly radical reform? I don't think so. And in fact, I've been involved in cases and consulted with cases where just that has happened, where the idea is, I mean, the, the most common and most frequent person going into guardianship, according to the National Council on Disability, are 18 to 24-year-olds with intellectual disabilities. Who has a better opportunity to grow and learn and develop than an 18-year-old? So I've proposed that in a number of cases where if someone who's 18, mind you, might not be ready to run his or her own life, guilty as charged, by the way, <laughs> then there should be someone who's able to say, I can help, or I'm, and part of my guardianship is going to be teaching you and working with yeah. you to develop those skills. 
And unless it's proven, like you said, that the guardianship is still needed, it should terminate. I completely agree with you, sir. You know, at the beginning of this, I mentioned Jenny Hatch, and I think most people probably have heard the name and knew the case. In 90 seconds, I know this is a tall order. Can you briefly tell us about the case of Jenny Hatch and how she is today? Yes, well, one, Jenny is and was a person with Down syndrome. At the time Jenny went into guardianship, she had had her own job for five years, her own apartment, neither one of those a supported or disability-based job or apartment. She had her own life, friends she hung out with, politics uh, that she was involved in, a church she went to. After getting into a car, an accident, she was hit by a car that caused no cognitive limitations. She was put into a guardianship where she literally walked into a courtroom in Newport News, Virginia, with all her rights, all the rights that you have, walked out three hours later with nothing. And when I met her, she was living in a group home, even though she wanted to live with friends. She was working in a sheltered workshop, making less than minimum wage, even though she was welcome to go back to her job. She was told she had to go to a different church than she wanted to. What we did with Jenny was showed exactly what we talked about, about supported decision-making. Jenny's perfectly capable to do the things all of us do. Jenny might need a little more support to make decisions, but in the same way that I need support and you need support, when we get them, she does it. And after a year of litigation, six days of trial, uh, Jenny was freed. Jenny is now living free and has been since 2013. She is working, she is living, and she is very happy. Jonathan Martinez, thanks so much for your work, and I really appreciate seeing you here tonight. Thanks for your time. It's been my honor, sir. Thank you so much. Be well.